Everybody can uh, see and hear me okay. So um, I think we've, I've really enjoyed having a lot of the, the presentations. We've had quite short discussions at the end of each of the, of the, of the, the presentations. And in this session, we wanted to have a little bit more of a, a, a panel discussion. And we're asking the scientific committee to, um, uh, uh, to, to join us here. So um, I was going to uh, just share some of the questions. I'll share my screen now, uh, going back to some of the, the, the the points for discussion. I'm just going to flash these up and um, uh, just so uh, we can uh, we don't have to keep on uh, re referring back. We have a number of questions. We probably maybe we're too concerned with the number of, uh, of topics, and I think we've probably got enough mileage here. Um, but I want to just open some questions up to the, to the scientific committee. Uh, so the first one we have is: Can R and HTA achieve any sort of cohesion, or is it best to splinter into a myriad of different flavors? And what are, the, what are the implications of this for the R novice? Now, I'll, I might expand on this a little bit since I was the, the person who penned this particular point. So if I look at HTA and I look at all the different packages that could be applied, I sometimes think it must be quite daunting for a master's student. And I presume, hopefully, we have a lot of people who are maybe at the master's level or maybe at early stage in their PhD, and they're trying to make up their mind of what they're going to, to look at. And I still think R is in its infancy in, in, in health economics, and I hope it goes from strength to strength over the next decade. Um, but are we falling into silos, or is it like the universe that we're going to achieve some cohesion, and will those leading packages pull together uh, and then take some, some uh, critical mass? So what do people think is, is, is going to happen here, and is this an easy learning environment for people starting off? So I've posed the question. And so do our discussants want to jump in with enthusiasm and offer opinions? So go on, I'll go first then. Okay, so so I, think... sorry, I was going to say, perhaps it, uh, maybe you've already done it and I just don't see it in the chat, but it'd be good if all the people in the panel would uh, put their video on if they can, so that, um, you know, for the, for the actual recording, we know who's, who's actually talking. But I'll, I'll leave it to you, Dawn. Cool, no worries. So probably the first thing I think here is that achievement of cohesion, I think, is actually impossible in HCA, regardless of software package. So, for example, we've been using Excel for an extremely long time. We've not achieved cohesion there by any stretch. So it's unrealistic to expect we're going to get that with R. <laughs> um, I'd expect that some conventions will come about and become standard, uh, probably through the HE tuition teaching. So more and more master's courses are doing this now, for example nothing to stop HTA bodies helping us there. So things like um, HTA bodies publishing basic file structure, documented functions for standard things we might want to do might be helpful. But actually, I think this is quite good for the R novices at the moment, because this is a real area for possibility for learning and development and making your own way <laughs> in a way that probably isn't the same when, when we were starting out in Excel, for example. So that's my opinion. Feel free to add. <laughs> You know, I just I was just going to maybe echo some of the things there before this session. I was actually just thinking about this question and how meaningful it was. And I, yeah, I think maybe even the notion of it achieving cohesion around you know certain key packages is maybe a, a false premise. But I think that point about uh, achieving co cohesion on you know um, on conventional ways of doing things, I suppose, especially when we begin to understand uh, issues of performance and reliability, which packages become most trusted, which methods have become the clearest, fastest, most reliable methods for doing things. Maybe that's the area of, uh, of consensus that, that, that I maybe I had imagined in, in, in the question. Um, I think if I can add something, um, there's, there's also a natural tension within an environment like R because R is free. So, you know, it's not like something like SAS. In SAS, I guess that uh, they're brilliant modelers and developers there, but they have um, much less freedom in the way that they work perhaps because they have to work within the commercial and uh, enterprise environment that they have. In R, nobody can ever stop you from deciding that you want to work on a specific package, even if there are 20 more packages that do the same thing, just because you want to do it. And you know, you could submit it to CRAN, and if you don't submit it to CRAN, you could just put it on your own GitHub repository, and people can start using it. So there is a, um, to some extent, we should try and talk as much as possible. And that's, I think, why 
things like the RHDA consortium um, are, are so important in, in my view, because it, it makes it, you know, all of these things become known and uh, maybe you think twice before replicating work that is already exists, or maybe you, um, and that would be our, our kind of preferred outcome. You sort of talk to the person who's already developed the package. You talk to Andrea who's already done missing HE and actually instead of starting from scratch, you contribute functions to that package perhaps. Um, but I guess, it's just contrary to the nature of something like R to think that there will be some kind of, um, you know, one for all way of doing things, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Patrick, do you want to go ahead there? Yeah, I, I agree with all that, but I think there's also the possibility that if um, we do have guidelines and we do have particular philosophies that become influential, then that will change culture. So, for example, if you think of um, something like systematic reviews, there are lots of guidelines. And even today, many systematic reviews are published without adhering to those guidelines, even though they're very simple and helpful, but they've still changed culture. Also in um, economic evaluation, there's something like Cheers guidelines for reporting results. And I constantly review papers that don't um, reflect those guidelines and they would be improved by people paying attention to them. But I think still there is a cultural shift that people do pay attention and over time it does improve. I think it will, or it will always be the Wild West, but I think if there is, um, it is possible to change culture and it might come out of initiatives like, like the or, or for HTA consortium, the, the, as Jen Luke has just said. Yeah, can I say something? So I think, um, I think the packages will live and die by how well they work, how easy they are to use, and the documentation so if there's a if there's a, you know a resource of uh, you know help documents or kind of cran um you know stan has its own forum for example if if help is provided and you don't need help often i think that those packages will naturally rise to the top so um i think it's then the onus is on the package developers so there's obviously a competition and the competition is the survival of the fittest in terms of those those measures um i i believe that there isn't a, a cran view for uh, like health economics or um, economic evaluation and i find that strange so if someone wants to uh, compile a, a, and manage a, a cran view that could be a a, a start as a, a resource and a go-to place because there's all sorts of um, different. I, I don't know how many cram views there are, but there's plenty. Of, so I think there's definitely mm -hmm. room for one for, for this bit. I, I Thanks so much. Yeah, that James, that we, so, sorry, uh, Jim, look, I might just say that we, we are encouraging everyone to participate in the discussion. So if you do have a point to make, please put it in the chat or raise your hand. Um, and I'll, I'll just put one point on this. Uh, is it even desirable for R to become cohesive and homogenous? Like one of the strengths of ours is that it's so flexible. There are so many different ways to do it, and everyone has a different preference in programming. And this is one of the strengths of R that is going to be so diverse in the future. Yeah, what, what I was going to say is that I, I didn't mean that we shouldn't aim at uh, making an effort to have some common guidelines, some common purposes. But uh, again, I think I. I I don't disagree with what you just said, Howard, that you know, uh, perhaps one of the strengths of, of doing this is the flexibility, the ability, the, the possibility of, you know, even outside of CRAM, if, if you need to do something on BCA, which is specific and BCA doesn't currently do, uh, well, you can just send an email to the developers and it's not impossible that that thing can be implemented fairly quickly. And then on the next development version that you can get from GitHub, that's already there. You know, and, and that's something that you don't get with Stata or SAS because they have other characteristics. Yeah, I, I, I would just offer them maybe a, a counterpoint to what Howard says there. I completely agree that I think diversity is very, very healthy. I think when a lot of the concern about regulators is about, you know, the reliability of an analysis and can we trust a, a certain package, I think the I think the respectability of a, of a certain approach to, to deliver uh, reliable results, I think, is go going to be an important part of what we do in terms of quality assurance, and especially when debugging is is a very very time consuming 
I could see why people might say that there could be an, an, an upside to consensus uh, on certain approaches. Now, it might only be in certain elements within an analysis rather than, you know, uh, the, uh, the whole analysis globally. But I, I can see that there's a, there's a, there's a trade-off there. Um, and, and maybe just another point that I was just thinking, maybe just in relation to what was just mentioned about requesting developments uh, uh, from developers of, of packages. I wonder, are we expecting it to be a little, the onus be heavy on the developer to kind of constantly cur curate and provide feedback to, to people? Because I mean, uh, I think we probably would need a sort of a, a community-based response on how to sort of effectively implement something. I can imagine people would spend a lot of time responding to, to simple misinterpretations of a package uh, yeah, well, that, that's the case. That's the existing functionality versus extensibility. You should be able to make your, your package modular and extensible, then other people can do what they want with it. And that's one of the benefits of open source. Um, another point is I, I, I haven't listened to every single talk, but I haven't heard any one mention of testing yet. And testing should be crucial and central to all of this. And it's actually pretty good now in R. And so, um, you know, you can do that and there's all sorts of things in the cloud that can automate that continuous integration. So I think that should be something that people should be more, uh, should consider more. Um, maybe this isn't the right forum to talk about testing, but uh, it's, it should definitely be in the background in everything that we're talking about. I think maybe that's uh, something we can think about for uh, the candidate R for HTA journal. I mean, I think we've probably mentioned before that that uh, testing uh, as a as a sort of a publication category could be something that we should encourage. Have we talked about the potential idea for the RHDA journal to this audience? <laughs> Secret. <laughs> Dan, look, do you want to expand? Yes, no, um, I, I think one of the um, ideas that we've discussed within the scientific committee, and by the way, this isn't an, uh, like a closed club, we've mentioned this already, but we do mean that we, we welcome contributions and uh, requests for collaborations and offers of collaboration. So uh, while people are here, I think that's a, that's a good thing to say. And one of the ideas that we've discussed, uh, among others, is whether there would be an interest and uh, whether it would be valuable to have a publication, the RHDA journal or whatever the name will be, uh, where we solicit what we'll expect will be a limited number of contributions. But um, I think we work at the intersection of, um, of various disciplines and areas. And sometimes it's hard to publish what we actually do because it may be too technical for some journals or maybe to apply for other journals. And so we end up in the kind of weird uh, land of nobody, um, um, where, for example, the full testing of a specific package that does something for HDA would be worthy of publication in an outlet like that. And it would be worthy of, of reading and it would be reassuring for people like NICE, because that would be uh, um, evidence that the package has gone some, uh, through some kind of validation testing, which is over, uh, which is beyond what CRAN would do, for example. Just submitting a package to CRAN doesn't mean that the package is validated or it does what it should do. It just simply doesn't uh, doesn't create errors when it's uploaded to, uh, onto CRAN. So, yeah. And I think maybe James, you want to uh, go and uh, and check the chat as well because there's a comment from somebody. Uh, yeah, I'm just chat. reading. I'm just reading Kashif's uh, comments. Uh, Kashif, do you want to come on, um, unmute yourself, and uh, and make the point because I think it's an important one, and I know it's anecdotal, uh, but I think it's a, it's one that we should hear. Yeah, sure. So, can you hear me? Very yeah. good. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. So, I mean, my my point of view was uh, this uh, free versus the enterprise one that uh, are to offer lots of flexibility. You can use packages available on GitHubs and even on CRAN. But I think a basic understanding what is happening at the back end is essential because if you're using uh, the package and uh, there are there are some issues at the back end and uh, then it is very difficult to uh, find out uh, or debug those. Uh, so 
that's why I put up a, a real life example where I was working on some, one of the package and then our idea was to combine the patient level data uh, from a reference arm across uh, different studies just to see that how similar dissimilar are those. Yep, so, so unfortunately the results were not coming up to our expectations and then uh, we were thinking that what's going on so we try to dig up and then at the end we realized that some of the mathematical calculation that were utilized were not a correct so we referred and then corrected and then generated our, generated our own package and then uploaded the corrected version on CRAN. Mm -hmm. I think this is a you know this is an important part of how science is supposed to work, and, and I think it, there's no point in in everybody having to consume time finding the same problems. And I think it would be helpful if we can find a you know a somewhat standardized way of re reporting issues to help people you know to help the developers iron out problems, but also to help other researchers who haven't um, uh, you have these issues. And, and, and Kashi, you, you, you did you ever notify the the, the, the original the developer? Yeah. So the, the challenge is that it's not always easy to reach out to the developers. I mean, you can send and then you'll have to wait for the response. Sometimes you don't have that that level of patience or time to wait for the response. Yep. We try to reach out multiple times to the to the developer just to understand that what is happening at the at the back end. But unfortunately, we did not hear anything. And once we re resolved the issue, generated a new package, the corrected one and then uploaded, then after a few after a few months of uh, time, we heard some response that they are working on the back end version and then trying to correct the things. But they did not notify that the existing package has some issues uh or it's not working so i think there should be something uh to to reach out in an easy way and if there are any issues then some sort of kind of caution statement this package is not fully validated or kind of a thing would be useful for the users at least that that they would know that they they are using at their own how, how do you call that <laughs> Can I just make a comment? I, I absolutely agree. And I hope that I wasn't the developer of the package that you were trying to reach out and didn't respond. And if you don't no, mind, no, no. apologies, but um, um, I, I agree that it is important that people realize that, you know, you need to be careful. You can't take things at face value. But even with a package that actually comes with a fully validation process and they tell you, yeah, yeah, it works. Can we actually be 100% sure that there isn't a bug? Because, you know, the only way of experiencing the bugs is to actually run the program and see that somewhere something gets broken. So I think that even SAS or Stata, which you have to pay a lot of money for, and they are brilliant developers, of course, but even then they, they can't guarantee 100% that the program is super solid, especially when it's just released. You know, when, when the routine is out for 20 years, then you know the chances that there is a bug hidden somewhere are very small but um on, on packages that are newer and more flexible agile i don't think you can ever have the 100 percent guarantee that there's nothing that would break this and uh, and i think the sense of the community working on that is actually very important because you know you you, you try and get over these hurdles I totally agree with you. I mean, it's very difficult to ensure the, the accuracy, even if you try multiple validation, but you, you never know the, the next level of the data. Sometimes uh, when you try something else, maybe more missing values and all those things, then the, some, some existing packages do not work. So you'll have to tweak to take care of those. Yep. So I, I totally agree with you. There's no guarantee. Yep. Some lovely points expanding on this issue. Uh, in the chat, I, um, I I think it is important to be democratic. I don't know. Do we do we want to invite some of the, the posters to expand at all? I mean, um, Paul Schneider, do you want to do you want to make a, a, a your point here to the floor? Uh, hi, yeah, uh, I can try. So um, I just think that it would be immensely helpful just to have like uh, to form some kind of R for HDA body that. That just tries to validate a core set of packages that are used in HDA, uh, and just I, I mean I, I don't think that so many packages have really big flaws or errors. Uh, but all the people who use Excel currently say, well, but we can't trust those packages and those developers in open source project. Um, and so I think it would 
be immensely helpful just to, to have like an external body that says, no, these packages are validated. They give you the expected results. How dare they not trust us? <laughs> well, Paul, yeah. I think that that's a really good like suggestion and something that would be really important to get R to be accepted by regulators. Um, I think just there's the logistical challenge of how do you fund such an organization. If R was being accepted by regulators, then regulators would have a stake in funding this sort of big validation project. Um, but if they're not accepting it, then they don't have such a motivation. Um, we can do it on a voluntary basis, but as we were discussing yesterday, people would have to be very bored to um, validate 4,000 lines of code in detailed packages or models. So I think it is something we want to get towards, but there, there are a lot of logistical hurdles towards such an idealized organization. I think it's definitely possible. I mean, there are communities that do have that. If you have a large um, group of people who can do the code review and you have a set template and um, you, you can do it all via GitHub. I, I know the, um, our open side does that successfully. And they, they, then you badge things that have been uh, that have been code reviewed successfully. So it's definitely there's a model out there and it works. I don't know how long it takes and I don't know how many people they have available to do it. But, you know, I'd be very positive about doing that. I think sometimes though the changes can be quite subjective. I remember having a discussion with one package owner about wanting to change um, their days from 365 to 365.25 per year and they just weren't having any of it. And things like crossing curves as well. I remember in the same package we wanted to ask whether or not they would have a function that could you know correct for curve crossing and they were just like well the curve shouldn't cross anyway you know so we're not going to include that we don't want any of that so there are some subjective changes in there and often i do find that you know a lot of models i look through are and also write are kind of a hodgepodge of different packages with own functions and i think that kind of consistency of testing is is important but also there is subjectivity in the, in the nature of the code themselves of what they want to do what they want to replicate what they want to actually create um and i mean this ties in sort of packages versus base r query you know at what point do we kind of actually you know people want to learn and go off by themselves and do their own things and then make the packages or um but i think the heterogeneity of of r is is, is mirroring kind of what's what's done in excel as to go back to dawn's original point um and having a single body sort of <laughs> uh, be able to, yeah, the administrative burden of having somebody go through our code would be quite high. And I don't know if that would, it would once again take away from the heterogeneity, which isn't, isn't a bad thing. Yeah, I, I think it, it, I wonder as an academic community, what can we do in terms of academic incentives to provide people an incentive to, to re, uh, review code and so on? I'd like to, to call on uh, Raquel uh, made a, a nice observation on this uh, this issue in response to Paul. Raquel, are you do you want to come and expand on your point? Yeah, maybe it's just to mention actually that having that sort of uh, validation body of the R code will be very helpful because um, I work for industry just for those ones that may may not know and. Um, Maybe some of my colleagues will have preference to use some other pack, some other software because they they trust more the validation that is done in some other softwares than in R. So I think it will be quite important because not only I mean not only uh, among statisticians but also for HTA purposes. I think it's very important that whatever is used has been fully validated so that we can really trust what is doing. And I think uh, maybe an important point is that I think I see this uh, sort of validation as one of the main barriers to, to use R more often. In addition, I, I don't want to, uh, to lose the sight as well that, of course, it may not be always um, possible to use R. And I wanted to bring this within the context of the first question that you mentioned before, James, about whether we can reach cohesion or not. I think we can reach cohesion at the point of doing the analysis, it can be the, the, the clinical uh, analysis, the NMA, but at the point of the cost effectiveness model, it's going to be more difficult uh, at this stage because some agencies are not going to, to allow us to present that model in R. So it may be feasible in the future, there's a transition that we need to go through until we reach that. But at the moment, 
uh, if we don't get that sort of validation from the packages, it's going to be much more difficult for, for us to be able to defend the use of uh, all the work that you are doing. Yeah, Thank you. Perhaps if I could tag onto the back of what Raquel's saying there, absolutely right. That validation is a massive barrier to us using R and HDA at the moment, even with HDA as accepted like NICE. But then maybe the fact that bodies like NICE are really struggling with capacity right now with all the different drugs coming through is something we can actually use to our benefit here. So for every Excel model that goes in, because they are all massively different and probably all containing some, even if minor errors, every single one of those needs to be QC'd. Whereas if we could come up with a set of standard functions that will be applicable in, you know, maybe even half of the HTAs, and they only have to QC that once, surely that helps with the capacity problems. Yeah, I think that's maybe the kind of that uh, granular kind of cohesion that I, I, I was imagining. Uh, um, there are some very good points in the chat, but Gianluca has his hand up. So Gianluca, do you want to go ahead? Yes, just to um, add to what Raquel and Dawn has just, uh, just said, and I, I, I don't disagree one bit with them. I think that there's an extra layer to that complexity, which is that sometimes the extra hurdle is that uh, this is one of my pet hates, perhaps, so uh, you won't be surprised to hear me say that, but there's kind of this divorce between who does the stats analysis and then who does the economic modeling. So not always, obviously, and not all modelers don't know what stats has been done and don't understand that. Some don't, though, and I think when that happens, it's dangerous because the modelers get only fed some part of what the, the whole data would be some part of what the modeling has been and and that really doesn't help and that is another sort of disincentive to 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 fully integrate in the whole process from you know upstream when you do the statistical model to downstream when you actually do the decision analysis in one single environment or in a combination of fully statistical software rather than just uh, doing some things in excel is fine when excel is fit for purpose when it when it isn't Excel or other spreadsheets, then that's where our problems come, I think. Mm -hmm. um, I just, uh, there's a nice point from, from Hannah O'Keefe. It's, it's quite it's a quite brief a point. point. Maybe I'll just, I'll just, I might just read it out. But she's just making the, the, the oh, we have a feedback from my, um, on my open microphone here. But uh, Hannah is just making the point that you have the problem of this kind of constant loop of package dependencies going back, which is very, very difficult to unpick. Um, there was another comment there from Gabriel uh, Pedra. Do you, do, do you want to make the comment and, and, and maybe how to give the re reply? And there was just, a, um, it'd be nice to, to, to hear the, the comment uh, for everybody else. Gabriel, do you want to, do you want to make the, the point? Oh, yes, sure. Um, yeah, I think it was just a point that I usually face. Like, I, I'm a really huge fan of R. I've been working with R for ages. And then when I started working with economic evaluations and developing C models, um, I always faced this challenge when going to companies and it's been inside of my company. When I try to propose this, there's a lack of acceptance across all other HCA bodies. And this is something they see as not cost effective. Like I'm not gonna spend, I don't know, an X amount of money to develop the, a model that will be only accepted for one or two HTAs. And I was just wondering if you, inside of the HTA consortium, if there's any branch or if you guys are already talking to other HTA models and trying to support or push this, this area forward. So Gabriel, as I was saying in the chat, we uh, were well aware of this issue. And um, when some of us do engage in commercial work and we happily propose, let's do an R model, um, there's huge pushback from the international market saying, well, we need Excel models that we can actually adapt. Um, so we are heavily engaged with NICE, uh, so we did have NICE um, former executives at our last um, workshop presenting and we have presented to the clinical guidelines group um, trying to push for more use of R and Bristol University is now set up as an ERG to review R models. So within the UK, I think we're making quite good progress, but internationally we're making less progress and we're very keen if anyone wants to work with us who has good contacts at say CADIF or the other HTA bodies um, to help push for the greater uptake of R internationally, uh, please do get in touch. Uh, just a comment on that. So I work at the National Centre for Pharmacoeconomics. Oh, sorry, yes. 
which is a bit like nice, but for drugs in Ireland, um, the, there is an issue with resources, I guess, in terms of staff and, and what, who already works at these agencies. If there is not already, uh, I mean, actually at the NCP, we would accept our, although we do ask for warning, you know, not all of our staff can look at an R model and you do have to be mindful of that when, when pushing for it. There is definitely a, a gap where some agencies will not have the staff uh, trained to do this. So there's, there will be a long period, I think, between sort of what we're talking about here, which I think is really exciting, and a point where you could expect, you know, you, I don't think you'll ever expect every member of staff in an agency to be able to look at these things. And maybe they shouldn't actually, because there is definitely scope to have, uh, at least in the NCP, more collaborative working where we have people like myself who has a background in statistics, but then other people who have, you know, the other backgrounds that you need. So, it, but it's kind of a chicken and egg thing because if you don't submit them, then we don't have the staff for it and we don't have the staff and you don't submit it. So it is very challenging. Yeah, I think that point about institutional capacity is very important to remember. Um, Gianluca, do you want to, to respond there? Yes, um, uh, again, I think absolutely right and a very, very good point. However, um, there's also another, again, maybe hidden problem. So if you are able to read the Excel model, but you don't understand the stats behind the Excel model, that is a problem. And if you are able to understand the stats behind the Excel model, then maybe you don't know the R language directly, but you're still able to understand what's going on. And uh, you know, going through the script or understanding what the script is doing becomes a lot less of a hurdle. A big problem is when there's a fundamental misunderstanding or, or lack of understanding of the complexity of the model, which goes, you know, it's nothing to do with R or state or SAS or Excel. That is the, the complexity of the model which we have to face right now, because when health economics was invented in the 70s, perhaps, or whenever it was, I think that people could get away with decision trees. That's what they were doing. And it was, you know, a groundbreaking at the time. Nowadays, you can never get away submitting to NICE a decision tree with two branches and, uh, you know, point estimates throughout because they will just laugh at you. So the models have become rightly so completely complicated because we are facing more and more complicated realities and the drugs that we have to deal with are more and more complex to, uh, to understand. There's all sorts of issues with the, the, the causal implications of the treatment effects and, and, you know, everything else. So that seems to me that calls for a rearranging of the nature of the people who work in this, in this field. Um, and again, I, I am very, very biased as a statistician, but I think that we need a lot more statisticians coming and work into this field so that they understand what's going on. Then do we need an R or a state or something else? It's just a dialect kind of thing. Yeah, I think that's a, a good point. Um, I, I want to go to, to Gabrielle. I just, I'm just going to say I'm having a nightmare as a chair because there's so many wonderful comments coming through in the chat and I'm just not going to be able to get to all of the fantastic contributions. I know people can see see them there, but Gabriel has his, his hand up, so I just want to go back to him. Yeah, no, I think that was just a good point from both of you. Um, on, on one side, the one way I see as a, a solving solution, or I don't know if it, this is some, something that RHJ could be, like, is if it's a lack of skills or training, is it is something that the RHJ will be planning to move forward, like training, I don't know, HJ bodies, but or like defining guidelines as you, you already been talking about how, how to get consensus on different, how to model things and stuff like that, what package to use. But also on the training side, there could be something that could be leveraged, like, oh, like do a training for HGA bodies for using R, for example, that could be a, a a one way of pushing things on on the industry side because then that by doing that you're actually supporting and then the industry could, could see the value of doing this because that R is amazing like all the, the stuff that you can do the, the flexibility and things you can run things very fast and there's a lot of good sides but it's just the applicability of of expanding this at a global level that it's being it's going slow right I don't know if it 
I think that in time, definitely as problems are, I think some of the problems we're seeing are more complex, then the applicability and the relevance of R will increase. So if you have a simple model at no point, and a simple model works for you, at no point do you need to move to R. But as we're seeing more and more complicated decision problems, then the, the pros of R, you know, come up and up. And we're seeing more and more complicated statistical analyses. So you do need those members of staff that are ready, but it, it will take some time. <laughs> Um, I've just, uh, I'm just going to go, uh, I, this capacity issue is definitely a, a, an important issue. I think also we have to remember that we're a selective audience of those people who have been, have been interested in, in this and, and uh, we're, we don't have that kind of representative balance of everybody else who's, who's established but without familiarity with our, um, I just, I wanted to make one small point, there was a great comment um, uh, from Paul Schneider about uh, a a grant uh, proposal to, to look at this issue. I can see maybe people need to kind of get their heads together and to think of, uh, of a EU grant maybe would be a, a good way to get together to address this issue. And I think Arthur White had maybe also mentioned earlier on the chat about at least the basic points of understanding what are the standardization of, uh, of how to, to QA uh, stuff and, 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 um, and maybe code conventions and, and so on. So, so great points there. Rather than maybe, so we have just a few more minutes left. I was wondering, could we hop to another topic just for a brief time? Because I, I feel maybe dwelling on one topic, it, it lacks diversity. So I wanted to look at number five here that's on the list. And it's somewhat related to, about using Shiny. So, so Shiny is very exciting in terms of what it can do in terms of providing transparency and ease of adjusting the tools. To me, Shiny is just it's another level of skill investment that I haven't spent time. Anytime I've spent time looking at Shiny, I've got frustrated and I've burnt up an awful lot of time. People younger than me have done it better. And so I've tended not to, to spend that much time uh, doing it. And I think this question that's on the end, you know, does this really add transparency or, or not? I, I, and I think that is something that maybe we need to consider because there's a lot of high expectations around Shiny, but are, are those misplaced or not? So discuss. Would anybody like to take that one? I could start if you like. Um, yeah, so yeah, I did the Shiny model presentation yesterday with Rob. And I think for me, Shiny is transparent. The transparency depends on who's actually looking through it, who's actually it, it's for. Um, it, I mean, you can have, if, you're, uh, if you are a uh, somebody who wants to actually be able to access the model, be able to um, see how things are going through the model and be able to interact with it, then if you, if you are not a technical R user, then Shiny is, um, is it, it massively increases the transparency and it depends on sort of what, what's actually in the front end. You can have a badly written Excel model, but you can also have a badly written Shiny model. You could present, if you have a well-designed Shiny model, which presents a lot of um, the functionality, the code, um, and uh, the processes in the front end where people can see them if they want to, that's, that's, that's very, very valuable. But also for the other flip side of that is the sort of testing that you see. Testing Shiny is quite difficult. So therefore you have the script, R script in the back, which you know, can be run independently of Shiny. So it depends on what you're using it for. If you're actually just wanting to play with code and, and view it and see the outcomes, it's very, very transparent. If you actually want to get into the nitty gritty and test it, you see it and do those sort of processes we're talking about in packages, you know, then it's, it's less transparent and that's why you need a complementary script to go alongside that is independent of Shiny. Um, so that's my take on it. Um, I don't know if anyone else's experiences are similar. I was going to ask Rose, given that you've clearly made such investment in ResMed in a beautiful tool, What's the kind of the reaction from clients to it on 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 issues of transparency? Like, do they trust what you show them, or do they then ask questions? Um, they ask questions always, and I think that's really important. Should be always encouraged. Um, some of the time, sometimes we uh, for the uh, clients who are not as experienced in R, they do ask for. Sort of us to explain it in terms that they do understand. So sometimes Excel, sometimes they'd ask it for it in separate R functions. Um, but I've never, 
we, we what we tend to do if there is a you know an issue we tend to just present more in the front end um if they're not happy with r and going into the r script themselves we say we, we have a diagrams in the in the in shiny um or particular controls um so they can see the calculations are actually happening in the back r is, is, is shiny is very very versatile for that you can see the calculations going on but without overwhelming the front end user if they're not comfortable with it um but yes, um, I think there's a, there's a curiosity there, it, but it's not been a black box. We, we do want to discourage that, and we have been getting a lot of questions, and they've all been very positive. Yeah, so tagging on to what Rose has said here, on one of the projects we've been doing, we have been asked to show that Excel is giving the same outputs. So we've done that. We found everything in the Excel as we were doing it, fun times. <laughs> um, but I think people just need to get used to the idea of having this sort of interface with a code based system rather than the current paradigm that our clients are used to. And that once we see it once, there's much more trust the next time round. <laughs> that makes sense. But that's very interesting as well, because I'm sure when you show them the, the Excel result, what they were just kind of mapping was that the number that you spit out in the shiny app is the same number that you spit out in the, in the excel spreadsheet rather than oh what is this number here and what is this formula in this particular cell of the spreadsheet so you know it's just a matter of you trust what the excel spreadsheet gives you a face value because that's all we you always seen and you don't trust the new thing because you've never seen it but um, you know yeah that's yeah. Thing. sorry yeah, sorry, I was just gonna, I think that's definitely the, 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 the case. Um, sorry, Rose, do you want to expand on that? Oh, no, I was just expanding on the fact that people are just afraid. I don't like seeing something new that it does sort of, Excel's been the thing that we've always kind of gone with, at least, you know. So having Shiny is a complete new tool, they're always going to compare back to Excel. Um, they seem to trust Excel in ways they shouldn't, but they're used to trusting Excel and not used to trusting Shiny, you know. It's, it's all down well, to the coder, really. I never trust an operating system update when I get it and always want to be on the previous one. Um, uh, I think that's human nature. Um, Paul is still <laughs> waiting with his hand up there. Uh, I see Nathan is drawing breath as well, but maybe I'll go to Paul first. Uh, uh. Uh, yeah, thanks. Um, maybe just to clarify, I think Shiny should not be seen as an alternative to a code review. Like if you want to re review the technical aspects of a model, you have to go through the code. Um, but what Shiny allows uh, uh, you to do is to, to like you have, you can, decision makers can engage with the model uh, if they don't know any programming, no coding whatsoever. And so they can like test different scenarios in the model. And what it also allows, but Excel doesn't, I suppose, is to do something like a live, uh, um, to, to uh, estimate scenarios on the go. Like while you're in the meeting, uh, if your model is fast enough, you can just impute and like in input a scenario that you're interested in and get the results while you're in the meeting in a few seconds. And so that, that is how Shiny should be like used, I think. Just tagging on to that also, yesterday I showed you in the video, we were doing a matching analysis. You know, this isn't that you would ever put in Excel. It's something that you'd, you'd get the outputs and just play, put into Excel. People might question it, you might have a report. But the actual ability to have a matching analysis, be able to tag the covariates, see the caliper, have all those outputs and have those graphs, you know, that is massively increasing the transparency and accessibility of that particular analysis. That's something that usually people don't see. You can give people access to really powerful analyses using this. Um, and that's something that you can't do in Excel. And there isn't really a equivalent at the moment properly. To my mind, that's exactly why Excel is not fit for purpose, because it's a good cosmetic tools. You know, you put things, you could do the graphs and show them and carry them around. But even when you do a full model in Excel, you're not really doing that because, you know, you will be doing the survival analysis in Stata if you're not using R or in SAS or whatever. Or maybe somebody has done it in state or in SAS and given you the results. So that's exactly right. I think I agree to a million percent with you, Rose. I think there's a separation here between what Shiny's for. I mean, I agree with Rob. Like, it's just showing you stuff. And if you use that for testing, you don't need Shiny. You should, you know, like, there's different, you know, from unit test to system level test. So you should be doing system level tests. And if you don't know what those test results are, you are expecting to see. Maybe Shine will give you an idea of what it isn't, like an elicitation. But ultimately, the testing is done outside of Shiny. And then, to be honest with you, you could run Excel and get output and feed that into Shiny. So just because it's Shiny, it's got nothing to do, well, nothing to do. It doesn't have to be running an R model. It's just a different way of 
of, of doing, of looking at the data and playing with it. So I think it's, got, it's important to be clear these are two very separate things. Yeah, I think uh, yeah, maybe the way that I've tacked, jumped to the shiny topic on the, the ba basis of the previous conversation, we, we might be in danger of conflating the, the, these two. And I think Nathan's comment is useful for separating those. Another um, comment coming from the uh, from the floor here. So, uh, Shubram, do, do you want to, to unmute yourself and what would you like to share with us? Uh, yeah, sure. Thank you. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Jim. So yeah, uh, just to so I'm I'm very extensive user of R Shiny and uh, like I have I have developed around twenty uh, more than twenty or twenty five apps in 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 R Shiny and uh, from every aspect of 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 uh, uh, like like the survival modeling and MA tool uh, early early models as well as uh, the cost effectiveness budget. So I, I I have developed all the models and the only challenge that I can see in uh, in shiny is that uh, like there's a there's a problem of 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 debugging if you have to uh, if you have to debug the codes of 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 if you like if you have to understand how how the model is working you have to look into the codes and this is the main challenge like we can run the model in the in, in the showcase mode we can save the intermediate outcomes as well to to present like we can we can save the markov trace or, or or whatever the intermediate outcomes or whatever the model that that we are developing but at the end of the day if we have to understand how the modeling how the model is working we have to uh, deep dive in, into the codes and i think this is one of the main challenge that i can see who is non r our programmer, like they cannot <laughs> debug the model if if there is any error, or if of or if someone needs to adapt the model. In that case, also uh, they don't they they can't do that with with some additional functionality if they don't know the R programming. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, again, maybe the way that I've introduced these these two comments, maybe I've I've overlaid this issue of of, of shiny and and, and um, model transparency and and, and QA. I've maybe done so in an unhelpful way, but I think everything that's mentioned there is, is definitely very true. Um, we just have, we, maybe we have about 30 seconds left. Hannah had made a comment in the uh, uh, in the chat. I wonder, do you want to expand on it, Hannah, for everybody's benefit? We might give you the last word here, because I think it's a good point. Okay, I'll keep this brief. I was just thinking in terms of Shiny, what it's made for is to be an interface. It's made for presenting things. So the same way that you would present data in a publication or at a conference or for a database or any other website, that's what it's meant for. It's meant for presenting things. So in that respect, when you're thinking about it in terms of transparency, it's no different from any other platform. And I don't think we should treat it differently because that's not what it's meant for. That's not the intention for it. If you need something that provides the transparency where people can look and explore the code, then you need to present that code up front somewhere like GitHub is the sort of go-to platform for, for sharing that kind of thing. Super, yeah. So again, I think, yeah, we just need to, yeah, not to criticize Shiny for things that it isn't, you know, pretending to do and, and, and so on. Um, and I think it, it, it does add useful transparency when we think about, you know, parameter values, outputs and, and, and so on. Uh, but yeah, we also need to be careful not to overinterpret what it tells us as well. Okay, well, I think uh, we're just about on time there. So maybe I'll wrap that up there and we'll have a quick break. And then we're going to reconvene at 10 past the hour for uh, the final uh, session when we have a longer series of shorter presentations. So uh, looking forward to speaking then. Okay. <laughs>